This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, lovely. So, um, firstly, I thought I'd start with a little bit of trivia. Um, do you know why the area of King's Cross is called King's Cross? Well, apparently it's called King's Cross because uh, the name of a statue was erected outside of the station at the crossroad of King George IV. Um, however, it was only erected between 1836 and 1845. However, the name still remains to this day. So I'm not sure if you knew that, but certainly I didn't before the, before the meeting. Um, I'm going to talk probably for 45 minutes about the enabling phases um, of the project. I'm going to try to sort of show you the overview of the, the project and then go into a little bit of detail about some of the civils and the permanent way elements. Um, and I'll be trying to talk over the top of some of the videos so you can kind of get a feel for how much work went on and what kind of work went on. In a lifetime upgrade to the infrastructure, a world renowned transport enabling growth, increased reliability, and maximising capacity for the passenger. The King's Cross remodelling project is part of the East Coast upgrade. covers all of the East Coast Main Line. At King's Cross, although the station itself underwent modernisation in 2012, the existing railway assets have not been changed since the 1970s. We've even managed to find some of the photographs from the original renewal period. The existing lines will be expanded to six running lines in the platform and throat area by making use of the currently redundant eastern bore of Gasworks Tunnel. New slab track will be installed throughout the east bore of Gasworks Tunnel, connecting King's Cross Station Throat to the Belle Isle area. The track layout within the throat area will be modified to increase the line speed, and all of the old 1970s OLE will be reconfigured and replaced to provide new structures and wire runs suiting the new layout. The signals in the station and throat area will all be modified and will be situated to serve the new operational layout. The new layout's been designed to operate at higher line speed within the platforms and the platforms have also been modified to serve longer trains and allow for greater operational flexibility. Upon completion of the King's Cross remodeling project, the infrastructure will be more reliable, maintainable and sustainable. The project is split into Morgan Sindel and Podtrack Limited, Balfour Beatty, Amco Giffen, Siemens, SPI, Limbrook, with Morgan Sindel undertaking the role of principal contractor for the scheme. Due to the scale of the project, there are a number of key sites and locations to highlight. Kings Cross Station, Kings Cross Throat Area, Gasworks Tunnel, the Bell Isle area, Copenhagen Tunnel, Hornsey Street Compound, which represents a major on-site access point for the project, Compound I and Compound Z, major site compounds situated in the throat of the project, Murphy's Yard, main parking for the project, the Stanley Building, with points of reference, the Emirates Stadium, Recycling Centre Hornsey Street and the Holloway Road. Okay, so in summary, the existing layout is at the top of the screen there. They had four lines, two slow lines, two fast lines, and a redundant eastern bore. And the scheme is to increase the line speed, as I said, and um, 
rationalise all of the SNC, including putting some of the SNC within the tunnels themselves. This created six lines within Gasworks Tunnel, line A, B, C, D, E and F. Um, and due to the layout and the change in the throat, we actually lose one of the platforms. So the existing platform 11 now becomes platform 10. The project's undergone quite a lot of change and um, I'm just going to talk about the very latest change. So in February 2020, we presented the um, details of the access to the oversight board, um, which planned for a 2020 December partial closure. It soon became apparent that we wouldn't be able to run or the operators weren't able to run a suitable service. Um, in March, we had to go through uh, a number of options and in, came up with a, an alternative called option zero. Uh, this introduced um, platform zero into service early uh, and allowed uh, a longer platform for, for the train operators to use. Then um, the pandemic hit and um, it was determined fairly shortly afterwards that 2020 wasn't achievable um, and we had to make use of the access. And then in uh, April 2020, the project was actually deferred till the end of this year. Um, this opened up further options to look at how we were doing certain elements. We looked at a three-way split option where we did it in three phases. Um, and actually in May, that option was endorsed. However, in June, we underwent another change where the government asked all of the key infrastructure projects to try to introduce the service early. And um, in July, we went through a, an option to start the partial closure in February 2021 with a revised 50-50 split option. This was some of the work we had to do to compare the access requirements and you can see at the bottom of the screen platform zero was uh, the 94 day half station closure and the three way split was 119 so there was quite significant changes made and we ended up with this layout. So halfway through December we effectively took out of service platform zero which allowed the early development of platform zero the alignment into platform zero and the eastern retaining wall we then have uh, the possession which we undertook which was stage two which went all the way from week 48 to week four which worked on platforms zero to six Quite recently, we've uh, entered that into service and we're now working on uh, platforms zero to uh, seven to 11. But as I said, I will talk about that hopefully in a future presentation. So whilst all of this was going on, all this planning, obviously we were working on uh, a lot of the key um, infrastructure and we had to make sure that we were briefing our teams uh, suitably. So we developed a visual type hazard perception that went into our induction looks something like this. DNO cubicle. Trapping point. Tight turning radius. End of Armco barrier. No stopping in the yellow box. Hall road pinch point. Caution, live equipment overhead. You must maintain a safe distance at all times. Pedestrian walkway. Height restriction, 4.3 meters. Traffic management system in place. No entry when the beacon is flashing. Pedestrian walkway. Unprotected operational line side cables and drainage. Pedestrian walkway crossing. Unprotected operational cabinet. Plant and lay down area. Road rail access point. Tunnel walking route. Remember, speed limit 5 miles per hour. Tunnel passing place. Pedestrians have right of way. Tunnel passing place number two. Pinch point.
existing hall road drainage. Caution, live OLE alongside hall road. Temporary turning area. Buried railway services. So as you can see, we were trying to get a more visual way of um, showing the assets with um, the, the teams and to uh, avoid just having lists of hazards going throughout the site. Um, and the first part of the works that was just past the end of the hall road that you saw on that last video was the deep drainage works. The deep drainage works were undertaken by Morgan Sindel and um, served all of the existing and uh, designed drainage. So we had to do slip trenches, trail holes to make sure we eliminated or um, avoided any existing services. We then had to do some sheet piling to create uh, jacking pits. Obviously being drainage, there was a lot of water in Belle Isle, so we had to use a silt buster to make sure that any water that we were pumping out had to um, go back into the system cleaner than it came out. We even used a uh, timber heading tunneling between the outfall and one of the reception pits. And then this was one of the, the jacking pits. You can see there with a the little spoil removal conveyor. And then this was when it came into one of the reception pits. You can see the sheet piles have been slid upwards and then the pipe comes through the wall. And then the pipe ready for connection in here. And this is kind of as we're starting to backfill now with the, the material um, building up to ground level and putting on the manhole as we come up to the surface level. The next thing I want to talk about is REB bases. There were five REB bases, but I'm going to talk about the one at the top in Argent Yard. So this is the area on the left hand side, vegetation clearance next to an existing access. This is creation of a working platform for the machine from, to be able to work from above and uh, reach over towards the railway. This is an augering. Um, Machine, oh, part of the machine. This was done because of the um, obstructions that was found in the ground. There used to be a big wall here and a turnout towards some of the historical sidings and we had to pre-auger the alignment. You can see on this section here the red area is the REB and the tan area is an old wall that led off towards the, the goods shed um, back in the good old days. Then we excavated around where that area was, created a bench, completed some more augering and piling as we went, wherever there was a refusal, a bit more uh, auger in there. And then this was a driven pile system. And we also used a vibration tool, which is called a Movax unit, which um, vibrates the piles into location. And you can see the noise deadening material we had to put on the outside of the, uh, the mechanism there just to try and minimize noise as far as possible. We then um, backfilled and uh, created the formwork for pouring the concrete on the edge there. Once that was done, we created the center of the REB done the reinforcement ready for pour, poured the concrete, you can see the roots already been installed around the outside to help. And there we go, it's the finished compound there with the fencing around. So uh, the next section then is about OLE bases. There were a number of different bases on the project, uh, both in the throat and Belle Isle. So these are a couple that I'd like to talk about. So firstly, um, I'll talk about this one. This is a large mass foundation. This one had a drain, you can see running through the edge of the, uh, and you can see the pipe there covered, running through the edge of the foundation. There was an existing drain we had to work around. This is the reinforcement cage. You can see it's gonna be a huge base. 
and this was it on site. There were two of these uh, installed in the uh, Bell Isle area. That was it finished, or one of them finished. And then finally, um, you'll see one installed with the OLE system on it. The next one is a circular hollow section pile. So we do a trial hive on every single pile, um, area just to make sure that there are no services. Again, using a Movax unit, vibrate the pile down into the ground. This was in uh, platform zero. We then make the area safe by putting the toppers on here. We then come back and put the steel on. And then this is an example of doing a similar system with a driven pile elsewhere in the platform. You imagine the disturb to the, the local residents, so we had to minimise that. This is um, where we're putting in a, a, a circular sleeve at the top of a, a concrete pile. So you put a sleeve in at the top of the pile, you then get an auger attachment and use the auger to take out um, layers of spoil. As you can see here, the machine's getting lower and lower, screwing into the ground, pulling out more and more material. quite a depth. All of the OLE was designed so that it had a non-effective depth where the trial hole was undertaken so they were slightly longer than normal but obviously there's so many services in and around the area. Um, here comes the reinforcing cage so once you've got it down to depth you put in the reinforcing cage and the cage has to go into very um, tight tolerances to make sure the OLE was in the exact correct position so that's what the engineers are doing there. Then the machine comes out of the way and when it's ready um, the concrete lorry will come along and fill the pile with concrete. So here, put a flume on the lorry there and fill it up. And then a few weeks later, we come along, put the steel work on the pile. This was just a blow. This one's actually a really interesting one because that had to be designed to take full track loading. So it's a metal box effectively so that the concrete could cure under traffic conditions. And then here's a time lapse of us loading one of the, or two of the bases that we'd already gone out and built in a possession, huge working platform for the crane. And we took advantage of one of the um, renewals in the platforms to be able to get an all line block and install the large portal, as you can see here. But you've got two moops on different roads, coordinating the lift. And then finally, obviously, whenever we're making any minor changes, we use the machines to do this, which is called a pan check or panning check of the wire to make sure that the wires are to tolerance. And I put this one in there because you can just see the bottom section of the um, canal there in the tunnel. And it's great. Not sure what happened there, apologies. Okay, um, the next section is about the slab track in the Gasworks East um, bore and LVT for the SNC. So I've used Romberg's slides for this um, because they've done a good job in explaining how it gets put together, but I'll try and skim through it as quickly as I can. Um, altogether, we had to remove 10,500 tonnes of spoil in the tunnel. That was because the tunnel was actually used to get rid of a lot of the spoil from the original installation of the HS1 bridge in Belle Isle. So it's full of spoil. All of that had to be taken away and uh, removed from site. We then had to excavate north and south and install a um, frost protection layer. We had to pump, obviously, a lot of the um, water out. We had to look at all the original um, false work pockets from when they built the tunnel back in the good old days and um, make sure that they were clean, ready for grouting. Um, pressure wash all of the tunnel. We had to backfill most of the false work po pockets, carry out a, a proper survey traverse of the tunnel and um, check the alignment and the, the movement of the tunnel when we were actually taking the load out of the tunnel. We then 
had to do all of the formwork, uh, mobilisation from Murphy's Yard, um, and get the construction team down on the site, create um, a working area at the north end, and um, install some task lighting throughout. So these were the little pockets that were all throughout the tunnel once we removed the debris and jet washed them clean. So you can see they were what the original engineers would have used to prop. And then this is something that we managed to get hold of um, as we were coming into, or as we just cleaned the, the tunnel. It's called a Matterport survey. And um, I've taken a video of this survey itself. But the purpose of this is that you run through it with a camera and you can use it as a survey. Um, it's used in commercial properties to be able to walk around the site, etc. But we used it um, as a sort of uh, easy way to go out and look at the site, take some quite um, accurate measurements. If you wanted, for example, to see how wide this uh, refuge was, you can go to a measurement tool and you can um, click on one side of the refuge like this and then measure across to see how wide the refuge is. So there's lots of applications for this kind of technology, but we use this as an opportunity as the tunnel was exposed to take a, um, a photographic record, but also as a proof of concept. And you can see there some of the original pits that were um, backfilled and the concrete line for the mass fill. So in terms of program, mass pour, 29 days working from south to north. Then we had 53 days of installing the uh, 315 millimeter reinforced concrete slab. We then had external works for about 60 meters on the north end, which was 17 days and then 25 days on each line for installation of the track slabs and then a further 14 days of external work. Total 163 days. So when I said about removing the material in the tunnel, I wasn't joking. If you look at the um, green line in the tunnel, that green line was the level of the um, soil and um, material taken out of the bridge uh, site down in Belle Isle. And that was pretty much throughout the whole tunnel. So before we did anything, we had to take from that green line right the way down to the tunnel invert, which was a massive job in itself. Then we had to do the big um, pour in the bottom. The pour varied from 605 millimetres deep all the way up to um, 1175 millimetres deep. It had to be installed in three layers, as you can see in the bottom there. Once that was done, we then came back in and installed the um, the reinforcement cages. This was a, a photograph of another site where they were building up, but we used the same principle um, on our site. And actually within our site, it looks something like this. So I've included a photograph there of where the, the pour was um, done to a point, and then you can see the reinforcing cages underneath. So if you can imagine that went all the way from one end of the tunnel, all the way to the other. And phase three then was the pour slabs. So that's where you install uh, a layer of steel mesh. You then place the tra um, track slabs on top, install the rail and the shuttering. You then use a leveling system, pour the concrete, take out the spindles and then weld and stress. This system looks just like this. So everywhere green you can see is where you would grout or concrete. And then the, um, and the sections taken through the, the, the section in the middle there. Um, and effectively these come in five meter panels and look a little bit like this. And each of these panels then was um, brought onto the site like this, stacked and then taken down and placed on top of the grid like this. And then we'd use the leveling system. You can see the leveling system next to the operative there to get the level of the, um, the panel correct. Once that was done, we brought a concrete wagon onto line A and installed line B and then vice versa for the other line. So this was a rail mounted uh, concrete wagon. You can see there the holes in the pour panels that were used to pour the concrete into. And the concrete was able to fill in all the voids. It was self-leveling concrete and you can see the adjusters there on each side 
in the form work. So yeah, you uh, start at one end when there's a gradient and there is quite a gradient at King's Cross. So you start at one end and then observe it as it comes down the gradient. So moving on to the uh, LVT, these used to be called Sonneville for those that remember those days, but um, Sonneville LVT, they're monoblock system uh, rather than by blocks in the SNC. So um, point of note here is the strapping on the center of these, the old LVT blocks were much smaller and because these are a large monoblock bearer type, uh, you have to strap the center to stop the boot sagging. So that was something that we had to make sure that we really took care to do and um, lay the SNC in. But effectively, these were all pre-assembled at Progress Rail. Um, they had to be checked against the 1 to 50s, but they also had to be fitted with the, the Romberg alignment system, ROSAS system, um, to make sure they're going to be able to achieve the alignment in the yard. They're then brought to site. Um, they've got this ROSAS system on, and then they use low flow concrete to infill around. So this is the system on uh, 50 75 points you can see there you've got the gauge and the level and you can actually make the micro adjustments you need to get the slab track cock on using this system and here's some photographs of the uh, snc and the pore and then at the bottom there you can see the transition two different transition um, points where you go from your pore slab onto your lvt system and the one on the right hand side is actually our one just before you come on to 50 75 alphas. Last section of work was the VTRAS system, which is the transition module. Come off the bottom of the 315 um, millimeter slab uh, for eight meters, and it was secured on either side with Gabion rule, uh, walls. So um, I'll try and now play us. Um, uh, time-lapse video and talk across it. The main thing I want to point out is how busy the site is. So you should start seeing cable works, you'll see um, lighting column bases and all other stuff going on alongside it. So it really was a really difficult project to integrate from a site works perspective. Yeah. People who did a lot of this, they were fantastic for the site works and the um, the site work videos like this. So um, this is the prep for the site. You can still see the concrete line in there on the right hand side next to the cable route. That's then get taken away and we start preparing the outer area. So the outer area there has been dug down to the, the desired level, drainage install. And it was so far she didn't see it, but the, the geotextile went down in the, um, the waterproofing, etc. Then installed the slabs, reinforcement, and you can see we had to build a little bridge off the end into the hall road. You see how tight the system is there. On the left hand side, you see there's a new lighting column has gone up whilst we're doing this. Then we work from line A to do line B. We've just poured the concrete on line B. We then get a temporary connection up onto line B so we can install line A. So all of this was done whilst Morgan Sindor were in the throat doing uh, the, each of the walls and preparation for Camden sewer. And you can see just how tight the top of the site is there. This is a possession where we did some drainage, you can see going on quickly over that weekend. And you can see there now we've got the gabions and the transition panel in. You should start seeing now the um, line A extension there. This was done in preparation for the partial closure where that line A extension and the line B ties into the existing fast lines and as, as i said i'll uh, cover that in a, in a later session but you um you can see the preparation for it just there from another angle luckily we'll have some veg clearance undertaken in a second um, but from another angle you'll see just how busy this area was pouring the concrete in the tunnel mouth this is get a good shot of the snc going down the lvt whilst this is happening on the outside so you've done your reinforcement, your base slab, and then just inside the tunnel. And then you're stuck, there you go, that's the LVT going down, rails on, adjustment made. And connection to the pore panels. 
and the formwork's going on, it's concreted and the other line goes in. And once this is concreted, they do a lot of fettling and making sure everything's okay, all of the drainage elements. And then they all use this area for others to come in and start doing some of the OLE works. So that team there, you can see, is doing some of the drillings for the north uh, top of the tunnel. So in terms of track, the slab track works weren't the only thing to, to be undertaken prior to the actual main um, partial closures. The track team actually is, um, did quite a lot of plain line renewals as well, which included number one slow and number two slow, 5134 A and B points. Obviously the switch tips were omitted, but we installed the um, horizontal alignment and uh, the S and C crossings and also 50, 70 points. And we renewed platforms one to eight at uh, Christmas 19. So I'll show you a few snapshots of what happened over Christmas 19. First of all, we went through taking out a lot of the um, scrap material. Now, some of the platforms were um, re-ballasted, some were a skim because of the uh, time constraints at Christmas. There was a change that led to um, some of the platforms being skimmed, some not. So this platform six wasn't. This was um, obviously the dozer cutting the formation and re-ballasting works going on. You can see there you've got dust suppression fans going at all times to try and minimise the amount of dust within the platform itself. And there's a better shot of it doing the uh, ballasting. And this is a TRM. I couldn't get a uh, video of a TRM on platform six, but this is an example of a um, twin jib TRM coming in and um, lifting in the panels for the platform. Obviously the benefit of this is you can have a train nearby with your panels on and you can quickly renew quite a lot of track. And here's a photograph of in of the Colas CRM. This was platform six again. And eventually reballasted and welded. And we had to reinstate the eutectic strip. You can just about make out in the foreground there, the zigzag before the buffer stops. And then full tamping to design line and level, ready for PodTrack to come and do some COPA adjustments when they do the platform renewals. So this was the uh, final alignment after um, 2019 Christmas. So um, certainly for me, this is one of the more stressful times. Um, high mass lighting removal um, from September 2020. This was carried out by CRSA. I'll just uh, play a little um, shot of this. So the size of the crane required because of the lift, it was over about 70 meters. We had to lift this high mass lighting column. We had to use a crane this big and we had to set the road up in uh, three segments and even had a smaller crane to do the temporary works for this crane. This is the actual um, lighting column itself when it was undergoing this uh, strapping. And that was it nearly strapped. And again, closer. The crane's in the background of the new Google super, super office going up in Kings Cross throat and there's a photograph of it being lifted out you don't really get a feel for scale here but that's um quite a significant piece of kit had to be lifted up through the through the knitting right up into the air and over all of the overhead line equipment you see there all of the construction work stopped in the background whilst this was undertaken large exclusion zone lifted right out over the throat this is a view from the south portal of gasworks tunnel and over onto the roadway. You make out the um, signal box in the background there. Yeah, this is uh, CRSA's little video of it. Going at the 
be a size of the works type, a famous PPT, more than the work. how far that reach was at that point. We're lucky we had the road closure accepted. That's really just um, engagement with the local authorities for us, so we're able to get the road closure we needed. They've been really helpful to all parties to a more than a single podcast. Um, and uh, they just need to jump to the spin it. There it is. And then they'll lay it on the docks. Get ready for cutting it up before taking it off site. The reason it was taken out by a crane was because it was originally welded. So you can take it out in segments, usually they're gravity segments, but that gives you a better feel for quite how big that was. The, just a bit on top there is um, the size of a, a man there stood behind it. So next then, um, I touched on it just slightly there, um, Camden Sewer, Chamber A, and the runs B to C and C to D. So Camden Sewer A to B runs, um, if you can hopefully see my cursor, A to B would have been across this part of the throat and then B to C and then C into the car park D. Uh, and I'll play a little section of photographs for you. Around here, you're going to see chamber B being constructed in the first hill in the throat. Anyway, this chamber connects to chamber A, which is on the far side, then you can see that the key to the groundwork, and then the alignment of the foot to the going down the front. If you are on the left hand side, See that the tailing board starts to grow, so there's one pin removed and a new one coming in. And again, you can see how busy the site was. There goes the new board being built and the existing one being taken down. The kick post board being installed behind there. Widen the alignment. We're then also connected with chamber B and the D now, and you'll see them going across temporary work. Again, for continuing, post going. Travel boards going in. Doing the PC. And the top of the on the work now. We had a surprise visitor we had to prepare for. So when she came on site, we actually spent two or three hours um, on site talking to the team. Still whilst we were doing chamber A. Great for the team to see him come out. He gave us a boost, this was just before COVID hit. So, uh, yeah, the brave thing to come out of sight.
this is a bit more detailed now you can see the king post there those um hollow sections aren't actually part of the construction they're just there to help set it and uh, this is the formwork for chamber b i believe yeah, chamber b and this is the curve in the, the sewer itself and then some of the temporary works we had to use and work around obviously this was supporting uh the existing fast lines so it had to be robust um so we had to work between all of those props to install the run like that between chamber b and chamber c and then backfill over the top this was actually chamber c to d but it gives you a feel for the, the construction process um, and because it was a good piece of real estate, we also had to put bases on top of it. This is one of the um, OLE bases. Uh, chamber A over on the other side, on the west side of the um, throat, started off like this, quite a big brick robust structure. There's so many, on that side of the, the yard you probably saw in the historic photographs, there used to be buildings there. Um, we had to tunnel by hand um, vertically to get to the bottom of that sewer connection. Um, which required a huge amount of temporary works once we got down to, to level props and then this was going to be where we connect across and that is the existing sewer that we had to replace we had to install a flume which was the metal part you can see there which was then supported the flume actually went inside the brickwork so we had to break out you can make out the brickwork on the bottom of that And there's a better photograph of us having the flume on the inside and then breaking out the, um, the brickwork from around the outside. And that's a shot of the flume from the inside. And obviously that was re uh, removed at the end when we tied in the final. This was the reception pit in chamber D where the, the existing uh, chamber meets back up with the, um, the new chamber D. And chamber D then will tie back into that existing sewer. And you can see the steel work there for where we're going to tie it in. That all goes underneath this area, which is the, um, the eastern wall. And the eastern wall extends from here using base slab and reinforced walls and some uh, poured walls right up against platform zero. On the left hand side here, there was a um, no go zone next to REB1 and this one of that and that was kind of how it looked when we left we then finished it with a fence and um, some of the other finishing and that was a little sneak preview of the uh, partial closure pictures so um, coming to December 2020 then platform zero taking out of use and creating a work site um, this was part of the uh, enabling section and then eventually turns into the Christmas blockade. So December 12th we took the platform zero out of use and put up a hoarding. This allowed the team to work behind. We used a water barrier system um, which had to withstand high wind loads and that allowed for full construction behind um, pod track there breaking out existing platform zero. You can see there they're also um, on top of the existing slab track all of that existing slab track had to come out to a certain point and this is the alignment that we were left with um, after the christmas closure so then the 10-day blockade which included the throat camden sewer a to b all the way across the throat so we had to tie into chamber b and we started from that side hand mixing the um the infill for the foundations there so all of that had to be um mixed and uh, hand hand mixed and filled these are little lifting gantries so you can lift um the units along fine tune them that run along the outside temporary steps all had to be waterproofed you can make out the yellow noodles there we had to put on the ole as well because the ole wasn't taken down then we had to replace the existing track um, back onto the alignment because of the hog over the the um the sewer and we didn't have time to do the full renewal 
And here's a time lapse that shows a little bit from a Morgan Sindel point of view um, what they wanted to put out. Effectively done in two halves. With the fast line first, you can see them going in there. Excavation. And we'll make out in a minute the machine starts to work its way onto what is just installed using the chemical work. There we go. Still the precast unit. over to that the 10 foot once that was done put the track back that was the track for the maintainer maintaining a fantastic support on this we really want to make the project better when we were coming and they really helped out over the system we then opened those lines carried on the flow line and that um soon you can see in the previous um, part of the presentation was tied in on this end. And we handed the railway back early. Those yellow needles were just to prevent us because we've got some of the lowest early um, pipes in the country at King's Cross. And when we were doing that work, we had to work under the overheads. So it was extremely um, constrained there, especially when you had to have quite a sizable machine to do the lifting of the pre-crushed unit. So this is um, a slowed down version of their time lapse, so you can kind of see it as it happened over the Christmas period. The so changes to run here. If you look on the north side, you can see the paint array, all of the prep works, we then dig into the trains. Base units in, put concrete on those, then came from the cast unit, made its way all the way across. See there, we've now got the big machine on a working platform on the flow lines. That machine had to play there and pull the unit through across. You see the guys there tying the sewer into the side of the array. Doing this, a lot of this ALO and then getting rid of some of this oil in the trains and the other possession. So that's the end of the talk. We've come up to the end of um, the Christmas um, element of the works, which was. Um, the last major piece of work before we entered into the partial closure. As I said, the partial closure will be another talk, but um, started in February and is due to finish on the 7th of June. Hopefully I can uh, have a good uh, presentation on that. And um, I've just put some references up here and then I'll give you a sneak peek in the background whilst we um, take any questions or um, any feedback. Thank you very much, John. Uh, that was a fantastically well illustrated talk. Uh, re really amazing series of works there that uh, you've talked to us about. And um, what percentage of the work do you think you've done so far, the whole project that you've presented there? Is that about two thirds of the work, would you say? Yeah, I mean, the, the enabling stage plus what we've done now, we're well over two thirds of the way. You can see in the background there, I'm giving you a little sneak peek of um, the partial closure um video and the new tracks that have gone in um and obviously there's so much more to sort of show level differences the alignment challenges the the survey control all that kind of stuff for the next discussion but i just yeah um i think we're pretty much three quarters of the way there now we're working in this constrained area you can see on the left um but yeah i'm going to try and keep some of my power to drive for the next um next talk Excellent. Um, if any of you would like to ask John a question, please either put it up in the chat uh, or um, 
you can um, put a comment there that you'd like to ask the question yourself, and um, I can uh, I can unmute you to do that. Um, so um, before I go to questions in the chat, there's just one there at the moment, but feel free to add them. Um, one thing I wanted to ask John, if I may, just to th get things going, the, the poor system that you illustrated for us with the little uh, precast sections, how does that cope with curved alignments? So it has to be um, installed, or, sorry, it has to be fabricated to that uh, alignment. Um, it's all done off site and therefore you have to effectively know your alignment, your final alignment before you order the, the panels. And they come as a as a sort of kind of kit, and then it's a top-down construction, so you can get the alignment um, perfect. We didn't have very much in terms of um, horizontal curvature on on this project, but we we certainly had a lot of vertical curves. Um, but yes, that's the way it would would be done through the pore system. And in, in terms of those vertical curves, do they similarly have to be built in as part of the prefabrication, or do you do that in a different way? No, I think in, in terms of the vertical, they're just five metre long sections. Uh, I don't think there was anything that was significant enough to warrant an actual um, a sag in, in the um, panels um, because you can, you can make those minor adjustments um, on site given the quite short lengths of each of the panels. Um, but having looked at the, the data that came in from how they were set out, they were within a millimetre most of the time. So it was really, really good vertical alignment was achieved. Fantastic. Um, if I could go to Paul Ebert first then. Uh, Paul's, uh, do you want to un unmute yourself, Paul, and ask your question? Uh, yeah, by all means. It was just something that came to me uh, during the talk. It's hardly the priority, actually. It was about the uh, high mass lighting was the first question I asked. And that's uh, just, is there a sort of underlying problem for the rail industry? Why did that have to get taken down then? Is there something we okay. need to look at? No, I, I think um, it was quite an old asset. It was still um, serving a purpose, but obviously being so high, um, it was quite difficult to maintain and to change any of the luminaires. It wasn't collapsible. Um, so therefore, every time you, you had to change any of the, the bulbs or lamps, you had to have quite a significant uh, amount of temporary works in a crane. Um, the new system that we've got or we've installed are smaller um, lights, but more of them, and they they can all uh, lay down so they're maintainable from the ground level. I don't yeah, think there was ever an issue, but um, yeah, it's just it was a very very tall single structure, and it was also slightly um, clashing with the alignment between platform um, seven and eight, sorry seven and six. Thanks, but it does highlight the legacy of what seemed like a good idea 50 years ago. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Chris Pollock, uh, do you want to ask you, un unmute and ask your question? Ah, yes, um, very interesting presentation. You mentioned right at the beginning that um, you'd increase line speed. Um, I remember back in probably 1990, 1990 when there was an attempt on a um, record journey between London and Edinburgh um, there was a desire to reach about 35 miles an hour at the south portal of Gasworks Tunnel and I wonder whether you've been able to achieve that. <laughs> uh, we've beaten it I believe. Um, I think I think it's 40 um, or even 45. I think it's 40. I'd have to double check. Um, I don't have that to hand but yes yeah, certainly it's, it's designed so that the, the modern trains can almost accelerate straight from the platforms straight out um, to a much higher speed and um, obviously get on their journey uh, sooner. So if you like, I'll, um, I'll tell you the exact speed. I can get you a plot for that. Or, um, Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll have a look in a second. But yeah, pleased to say it, was, it's, um, it's, it met that requirement. So we're ready for a, a, a new speed record then. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Maybe. Yeah. Paul Meads, would you like to ask your question? You just need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, John. Um, I was really interested in how you were describing the pouring of the self-leveling concrete between the base slab and the precast track units. I was just curious whether 
whether any special bonding arrangement was needed between the between the already already set concrete no i don't think so um i think that um the concrete system itself was designed such that they kind of um they're used to being together as probably if I want of a better term um the the key's good uh or mm -hmm. good enough for for the you know the two systems to to um to meet well and um i certainly didn't hear of any special uh, bonding for the the concrete um i know that the guys obviously take a long time the the um the guys from Romberg, it's it's kind of their bread and butter, and they were it's really fascinating listening to the the care and uh, attention they took to mm. the concreting and and the way that they were doing their works. Um, and obviously, when you get a specialist in their field, they know all of the um, the, the specialist um, uh, elements to their work, and it's really really quite interesting. So uh, yeah, if if you don't know much about Romberg, um, check them out because they're a really good company and they've got a lot of really good stuff on their website, which is uh, up on the screen there. Oh, well done, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Joan Harry, uh, welcome this evening. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thanks, Andy. Thank you very much, John. That was a really interesting presentation. I'm sure it's a fantastic project to be involved with. So I'm interested to understand, you've obviously shown us quite a lot of um, construction there that's now permanently buried. And I'm interested to understand how you manage the test and inspection regime and um, making sure that you know where all those assets are fed back into the asset owner. Yeah, so um, this was quite an interesting from um, a PC versus principal designer um, perspective because all of the contractors on the project are client nominated contractors rather than PC nominated. And therefore they've agreed all of their own um, quality testing or quality procedures with the client rather than the PC. So normally I'd expect to be um, chasing people for um, ITPs and the outputs of their quality plans, etc. But that was done from each of the individual contractors back to the client in this case. So, for example, Morgan Sindel, when they did the deep drain, they had an agreement where they uh, survey the installed position and each of the ITPs was checked and verified by the PEs rather than a, um, a PC. Mm -hmm. OK, right. And, and then was there any level of independent sort of assurance done on that, John? Only through the DPE. So it's one of the areas on King's Cross that I um, didn't really get involved in. Um, mm -hmm. I know that each of the teams have got or had to um, produce the plans and ensure that those that information was captured and i know some of the um some of the teams were probably more robust in terms of their um, site capture so morgan sindel for example i know some of them even took um sort of photogrammetry captures uh, for some of the assets that were buried so we've got a, a sort of visual record even um, before it was backfilled um, but some of the others, they were less less so. They were still um, surveyed um, using a topographical method um, and then marked up on the, um, or in a red line for the, to use an old term, um, traditionally. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. No problem. Good stuff. Uh, Scott Chapman has uh, got a question for you, John, as well about, um, about, uh, supporting the track during that work. Scott, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi there, John. Um, brilliant presentation. Thanks for going through that. I I could pick your brain so much about all the as builts and moving towards compliance and the platforms engaging, but I'm doing my best to resist. So one of the things that stood out for me was there was a lot of cases where you had a lot of heavy groundworks that were in close situ to the existing and working lines. And with all that activity, yeah. some of it was actually by S and C. And I just wondered what track monitoring system was used. Was it conventional, or was it moving towards the remote systems that are now becoming um, apparent as we move forward? Yeah, again, this was more of a, a casualty of um, the independence between the contractors. So, um, from the Sublime, whereby Romberg. Uh, installed live monitoring in the Gasworks tunnel because they were uh, unloading the tunnel. Uh, they had to know exactly what was going on and when it was going on. Um, but some of the others were um, just using traditional methods next to the S and C. Um, and yeah, it wasn't um, it wasn't as robust as 
you know, you can do it, but it was certainly met the standards and, um, you know, certain of the smaller items like the bases going in, um, use traditional methods. And as I said, in the tunnels and um, where we did longer excavations next to the, the track, um, that was more robustly monitored, but all of the monitoring plans were reviewed with the PE and um, the track CRE for design took a really um, kind of grabbed the project by the scruff of the neck and made sure that all of that there was a sort of minimum level achieved for it all so it was um it was it was good in that regard thank you john okay thanks scott um steve clark you've got a, a question about the complicated works and planning for it would you like to unmute and ask your question yep thank you uh, very much very interesting presentation uh, that uh, i'm just wondering um from the planning side of things obviously there's a lot of work interfaces a lot of work areas um across the across the whole section there and it's just about how that was coordinated between all the site activities and how long that planning period was and kind of what form it it, it took to make sure that all the works could then run smoothly and all the activities could be coordinated all at uh, all at the appropriate times so that's a fantastic question, Steve, um, because it really is the, you know, the, the heart and soul of what King's Cross had to do uh, to, to be a success. Um, there's two parts to planning in King's Cross. There's a sort of like look ahead planning, whereby all of the teams say we're going to be doing these kinds of activities um, well before T minus 12. And um, they are integrated on a program level. So uh, in general terms, each contractor says, yes, you can come in here. No, you can't because there's this activity going on. And uh, the, the program is, is developed such that each of the, the contractors have an opportunity to fit their, their construction works into the program. And then at T minus 12, it comes to the, the PC team, a guy called Aaron Toner, who's our um, site integration manager. And his, his responsibility is to integrate the construction work from T minus 12 down and um, the way in which they do that is actually look at the timings look at where their machines are accessing for example because quite often from a program perspective you don't think about all of the construction elements the trains the access whether there's any ex access constraints the deliveries that kind of thing that actually make a big difference so in principle the planning's done um, and then at t minus 12 the real what i call core integration is done where you actually talk about logistics materials people plant access etc yeah thanks for that uh, very uh, very interesting i hope that i hope the chap was uh, suitably compensated for all of those uh, works that he was uh, doing <laughs> sounds like a very important <laughs> man <laughs> Yeah, well, he, he wasn't alone, but, you know, he, he effectively um, took it from T minus 12 all the way down to the whiteboard where each of the teams described their works and um, kind of brought them together to describe the next section of works. So it was kind of like a, a traditional construction during the week um, whereby you were working not on any of the line, you were working line side in the civils environment and then major weekends or um, especially larger possessions went down to the very fine detail for all the timings for DWP, et cetera. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you. A lot of collaboration. So Indeed. Yeah, thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. Excellent. If I could go back to uh, Paul Ebert, who had one other question about, um, about money. Paul, are you still on? Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. It's just a phenomenal job, uh, John. Thanks very much. And all the temporary works and diversions of sewers and things. And I just thought, how is this justified? It's touched on with, of course, the speed speed increase. I can see that. But when I think about the job at Cardiff, where we've also had really good PWI presentations on the intersection bridge, and the, and they they could not justify doing all the sewer works, and they had to look for a sort of cheaper, sort of short term option. So, uh, I mean. What was the key driver to uh, enable this job to go ahead with such an impact to the local community and the railway? Can you answer that? Think, yeah, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was kind of seen as a, a flagship a flagship project for the East Coast upgrade, and um, it was kind of we're going to do it once and that's it. We can't dance around our handbags anymore. A lot of the infrastructure was quite tired. 
Um, there were ways in which we could have potentially not impacted Camden sewer, but the asset itself was quite old. It was too much risk involved in not doing a lot of these diversions. The, the horizontal and vertical alignment, sorry, especially the vertical alignment over the sewer, you'll see it in my next presentation, was terrible. Um, and now it's it's great, you know. Um, so a lot of the, the work that we had to do has kind of been waiting in the wings to do for a long, long time. And there was massive drainage areas in Belle Isle, which have now been um, remedied and tied into the deep drain. Um, and which is why I tried to sort of show this as in the enabling works to sort of show what we had to do just to get the, the facilities back to where they should be before we build our new railway on top. Because it would be a shame to build this brand new railway and then have it flooded or then have, you know, faults because of, um, you know, the top going off because of poor formation or, or you know, assets under the, uh, that start to fail. So yes, it's a it's a big expensive project. It's part of a bigger, more expensive East Coast upgrade. Um, so you might have heard of the the Warrington project where they did the um, grade separation. Um, yeah. That was another project that was part of the uh, East Coast upgrade. So thanks, John. Yeah, and I think well done to whoever managed to get the business case through. Well done and great for the rail industry. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Okay, and one more question in the chat from Tim Kendall. Tim, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Andy. Uh, John, yes, it's a really interesting one. And like all uh, terminal station projects, you've got layers and layers of uh, services. Your uh, the drain there, I remember when we did Thameslink, we had a, a river going through our site there. Uh, <laughs> are you using... A, a full BIM model for everything that's being done there. So, you, A, you know in the future where everything is, and also you can coordinate particularly all the people who, who are so interested in putting wires through the most highly stressed part of any structure. Yes. Um, again, something that I will touch on at my next presentation, I think I, I was trying to, I can't do it justice if I just had a few, a few minutes, um, a company called SPI, were the lead design organization for this and they um, had a centrally controlled model for the, all of the works uh, and then they took extracts from that to do things like driver training they did um, visualizations which was some of the elements that i'd used um, on the introduction that i did and um, yes all of the design information was put into a full model those models were used for all of the integration and they will go um, back as a record to Network Rail. So um, I'm pleased to say that we have got a lot of um, design information and full model information um, available for everything we've built. That, that's really good, because I, I believe that things like that are really essential these days with the added complication and more difficulty of survey work. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the more we can, you know, the more we can do of that, having seen it, how successful it works, you know, when you're in an, a site like this, um, how how you can use that data for other things as well. Um, I even used the BIM model visualizations for hazard perception between the stages. And again, I'll show you that in the next presentation. But effectively, I flew through the model to highlight to the, the workers where the electrical hazards would be in this 50-50 split you can see on the screen here. So, um, you know, some of the structures still had live assets and I was able to use that BIM model, even though it wasn't, you know, the exact millimeter, I was able to use it to show visually people what could cause them harm. And I think it's great. You can use this technology for multiple purposes. Thanks very much. Um, that's the end of the questions on the chat. So um, I'll just, if I may, um, uh, give a first vote of thanks from Julian Mason, who says, excellent presentation, John, a great representation of the works achieved in a particularly challenging environment. Uh, and and I, I, I would completely concur with that. Um, and the, the challenge of the environment uh, came across very clearly in your, in your presentation. Uh, and the the amount of planning and preparation that must have gone in to make all of those works successful and safe uh, is is absolutely commendable. Um, so it looks from this presentation that um, 
that, that you've been achieving the the aim of making it a, le a, a legacy project and and not dancing around the handbags as, as, as you said um the the attention to detail there is is absolutely fantastic in in such a uh in such a difficult site and uh, I was particularly impressed by the the work through through the tunnels there and laying those slab tracks through the through the tunnels. Uh, very impressive, um, very impressive piece of work there. Um, so thank you very much indeed for sharing King's Cross One with us this evening. And uh, I'm really looking forward to King's Cross Two in a few months' time. And uh, Ladies and gentlemen who've uh, who've heard the presentation, uh, I'm sure you'll be looking forward to it as well. So um, we could try flooding the internet now and just giving uh, giving uh, John a little uh, internet round of applause. Thank you very much.